to episode 61 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 15th of April 2019. I'm Joe, and with me are Graham. Hello. Will. Hello. And Stuart. Hello. Who the fucking hell are you? <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind of you, Joe. Nice to be invited <laughs> to the show. <laughs> Yes, uh, so Stuart Langridge of Bad Voltage fame, and uh, what was that one many, many years ago? Lug Radio or something? Lug Radio, blimey, yes. That was a long time ago. Yeah, so you've uh, kindly agreed to fill Phelim's shoes while he's away in, uh, I think he's in Los Angeles, the bastard. Uh, but yes, anyway. So yeah, thanks for that. Um, right, well, let's crack straight on with the news. And um, Chef has decided to ditch its open core model and go for completely open source Asterisk. What do we all think of this? Is there an asterisk? They're doing the Red Hat model, right? Which is the the binaries. Um, you can't redistribute them, but the but the source code is all open. But that seems fine, right? Yes, that is fine. But they don't really mention much of that. That's not the huge message, is it? That's kind of the the sort of separate message that it's all open source now. But by the way, you're going to have to pay for it if you don't want to build it yourself. Yeah, but. That, to me, seems like the open source model we've always been told is the open source model. Right? If someone comes to you and says, how do I make money while giving my software away for free? That's ridiculous. You go, well, it's fine. Just um, give people the source code and sell subscriptions or sell documentation or whatever. This is exactly what we've always been told is the thing. Well, yeah, and it's working pretty well for Red Hat. So it seems like a better approach than the likes of MongoDB. It, it certainly seems better than this idea of coming up with a no, it's not really quite open source model because you're worried about people you know running big clouds taking it and using it and you not seeing any of the money well exactly yeah it's a kind of creative solution to a problem that a lot of companies have been trying to solve over the last six months or so and it seems to be probably the best solution because you're going to keep most people happy aren't you because those who are really too cheap to buy it and want to build it themselves, they are going to do that regardless. Whereas most companies who are actually going to spend decent money on this are going to just pay up and not worry about it. Meanwhile, all of the Free Software Foundation type people are going to praise them for being completely open source free software. And so it's kind of win-win. And it would be good if this does work out, I suppose, because then maybe the other players in this space could learn from them and actually go completely open source. I think that's kind of the idea. Part of the advantage that you have, if you're trying to define your product as the thing that everyone uses, then getting everyone to use it is a good idea. Obviously, you want as many of those people as possible to pay, so you've got a viable business. But the people who won't pay, if they've got a way of getting your product for free, then they'll start using it as well, and then you end up dominating the industry, which is great for you as a company, right? Oh, no, I think it's really good too. I mean, it's a clean, crisp message, and it's the message that, you know, we've in open source have wanted to tell for a, a long time. It's difficult to get behind a project where licensing is ambiguous and you don't fully think that they've got 100% confidence in the license when some parts of it aren't. And, you know, the only offensive part now is that uh, Adam Jacob used the word stoked three times in the same paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> So I suppose it is ultimately good, this then, um, and we can't be cynical about it, which is a shame. Should we try and be cynical about the VMware lawsuit then? <laughs> cynical about VMware or...? Well, maybe uh, Christoph Helwig wasting everyone's time. This goes back a long way, doesn't it? Presumably you were covering this uh, quite a while ago, in, um, but probably even back in Linux format days, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. I'm very much a pragmatist like uh, Linus Torvalds is, I think, on these kind of issues. Um, but at the same time, I do have a lot of respect for um, the Software Freedom Conservancy and the work of Bradley Kuhn and Karen Sadler and all those kind of things. And in some ways, so this is this is to do with basically VMware, if I can remember, having their own kind of hacked kernel and they didn't release the source code to their hacks and this was kind of reverse engineered and discovered by Christoph Helwig and it became a case. And I don't know how it pushed things forward other than uh, the Software Freedom Conservancy like to, 
highlight these fact these things so that people can realize they have to you know there's a certain um obligation when they use free software um and the obligation is to release the code of the stuff they've changed and i suppose they're doing that to keep that that's a worthwhile thing to do but they need to pick their battles wiser i think possibly especially when it's going to take 10 years yeah the news here of course is that this is over now they've decided to give up because the appeal wasn't overturned it was upheld and so it's just not happening. And coincidentally, VMware have decided they're going to remove that code anyway because it's so old and shit at this point that they're going to rebase it on something else which doesn't infringe the GPL. And so ultimately, Christopher and the uh, Conservancy got what they wanted because they, they weren't going after a load of money here. It was really just a case of wanting to resolve it and have VMware come into compliance. And that, that's what they always say. And I don't have any reason to disbelieve them. I don't think they're a money-making machine, are they? They they really just care about software freedom and, and want licenses to be respected. They're super short of cash. In fact, when you look at the uh, the number of projects that they, they kind of curate and look after, it's like 50 plus, um, and they have very little money. I think um, there's potentially another motive in here, which is slightly less pure, but I, I certainly agree they're not after money. But to me, this case felt slightly like a moonshot in that if they brought the case and then eventually it didn't work out, then fine, big companies with enough lawyers will carry on doing this sort of thing, but they were doing it anyway. So we haven't really lost anything. But if they brought this case and won, then the Conservancy would have a great big stick with which to thwack other companies doing this sort of thing. So there was an upside from for their goals if they won, and not that much of a downside if they lost, so it was worth it. Now, whether the amount of money and time and effort they've put into it justified that attempt is another question but it feels like there was there is some worth in having tried this from the point of view of their big picture goal of being able to stop other people doing this sort of thing the cynical part of me feels that there must be better things to do with your time and energy that are more effective in educating people if that's what this is about it's not the threat that the conservancy is going to come after you and, and you know chase you for 10 years with their limited resources there must be a better way of you know making people do the right thing i think there are certainly better things that the community the open source world as a whole could do with their time and effort i'm not sure there's anything better that the software freedom conservancy could do this is literally what they're for Mm. um so the point is if we decide collectively as a community to the extent that such thing exists that there's better things to do what that means is give less time and attention and money to the sfc and put it other places instead which obviously the sfc are not going to be particularly keen on Um, All right, well, let's move on. And something that you uh, put forward for this show, Stuart, was about measuring standards for web technologies. And I'm afraid it was a bit moon speaky for me. So you'll have to explain this to me. This is um, a write up by a bloke called John Jansen, uh, who worked on Internet Explorer and has uh, has been working on the web platform for years and years and years. Um, But this is not particularly about web technologies what he said was when microsoft started building ie8 and started to grasp the idea that hey maybe we should do standard stuff that's a good idea the big flag bearer this is before chrome even existed so the big flag bearer for standard support in browsers was mozilla with firefox and to some extent, the way the IE team went about changing that perception in people's minds that Mozilla were the flag bearer for standards and they supported everything and everyone else didn't was to go, here are a shed loads of tests for everything. Loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of compliance tests for, for new standards that we support and everything in order that the Firefox team would have to spend a whole bunch of time checking those tests, verifying that Firefox passed them, making changes to Firefox so that it did pass them. And every every minute they spend doing that sort of thing is a minute they're not spending innovating, building new stuff, so on and so forth. And it made me think that this is potentially a kind of a problem for not really open source projects, but under-resourced projects in general. That if you're fighting against someone bigger than you, one thing they can do is just bury you in work and 
I wondered, do we think this kind of thing is a problem? And do we see evidence of it happening elsewhere? Well, someone once told me that perception is reality and never has it been truer than it is in this case, right? That you can, as you say, swamp other other companies um, entirely by twisting public perception about what it is that you do versus what your competitors do, dressed up as doing good work for, for everybody. Um, and yeah, if people believe that your product is fundamentally flawed, then you're going to have a really difficult time swimming against that sort of public perception. That's exactly the thought. I mean, imagine uh, we wanted some kind of, we wanted to prove that one podcast was better than another. One way to do that would be to come up with a sort of a podcast compliance test. Here's the list of things um, that people need to do to be a great podcast. And then you say, but anyone can contribute to that. Anyone can put things in that list. Anyone can discuss the list. That's great. Let's build a community around this. And then you put a hundred people onto submitting ideas that your podcast is good at and LNL isn't. And at that point, you can't keep up. So you look worse. You look like you're not meeting this standard. But if you say, that's not fair, you're dominating the standard. They can just say, no, 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 anyone can contribute to it. It's all completely open. It's a standard. It's collaborative. So it's a way of moving the Overton window, of changing the public perception, exactly as you say, of what is good and what isn't, which is quite manipulable if you've got a shed load of people to throw at it, If which you have if you are Microsoft in this case. The point um, Jansen is making is that it's kind of what – chrome are doing now i mean the 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 web platform tests are ostensibly a cross browser cross company cross community definition for uh compliance to the web platform and chrome uh have two-way sync in between the chromium source and the web platform test someone adds a new test to the web platform test whoever they are chrome is automatically tested against it they had a new test to chrome it's automatically made part of the web platform tests so that, to me, if you'd just come up to me in the pub and said that, I'd have said, that's a great idea. Well done. They're contributing to it and everything. But actually, what they're doing is dominating it because they've got infinite money and Mozilla haven't. Is this just an inevitable consequence of the fact that big companies have more players and therefore get to shape things more often and there's nothing we can do about it? I think it's a really good point, actually. I hadn't really thought about it much, but... You know, Google, Google and Chrome, they also get the the extreme caveat in, you know, Google Docs not working on other browsers or you're not being able to copy and paste until you use Chrome and the search results are only delivered. You know, they still get all the get out clause with their dominance in other areas. So they get their cake and eat it. It was a depressing read, actually. I, I read it and thought, how sad that there are engineers working at Microsoft whose, whose job it was really to undermine Mozilla, who was perhaps the best placed organization to maintain a free web. So what we're saying is Microsoft and Google are a bunch of bastards. So we haven't really learned anything new there. Then. <laughs> but I think it's finding a solution, isn't it? That's the challenge. I think that's what Stuart's asking. What can we do? Yes, precisely. I mean, it's not just that. I mean, seriously, every test that goes into the web browser test, Chrome passes, which is great. And yes, there's a whole bunch of stuff which maybe other browsers do, which Chrome would fail, and it's not happening because those other browsers don't have the resources to write up the full test suites and get them into the web platform tests. But they don't have the resources. It's not like sitting about on a chair and complaining about it is going to mm. fix that. But what the what the uh, what the the article did was kind of open my eyes to the fact that having a collaborative standard may not be the panacea that I thought it was. But exactly as Graham says, I I don't have any better ideas. I was kind of oh, I'd never thought of that. Is adding tests to the, the test suite not shortcutting the work that the W3C are supposed to do? Like, should you not have a standard ratified and agreed by, by the W3C before you write a test for it? It's a bit more fluid than that. Um, but that's the way it used to work. And what happened was everything froze dead because you ended up with uh, the people who decide on the standards are not people who 
um, want to build things that are good for the web. They're people who enjoy arguing about standards. So what's the purpose of the W3C now? The way they do it now is what they call paving the cow paths. So to a large extent, people realise that if um, the W3C or what WG sit in kind of an ivory tower and go, this will be the standard, and the browser manufacturers go, well, we don't care about that, then it was pointless. Um, XHTML2 opened everyone's eyes to that. So now it's... There's this kind of uneasy symbiosis between them. The st- the um, the standards makers uh, define a thing in accurate detail. The browser manufacturers implement it. But a lot of the time, they're the same people. And things are done in a kind of, yeah, we think this might be a good idea. Here's some innovation. And then we'll standardize it a bit afterwards. But it's done much more in the open. In the same way that... Um, uh, Ubuntu, for example, might, might go, here's a new thing that we're doing, but we want it to be open. We want everyone to use this. It's not a big secret thing which we're going to keep you away from. But equally, if you just start with a blank piece of paper and go, we think we'd like a feature like this, come and help us design it, you'd never get anything done. Mm. So there's this kind of one hand shaking the other vibe to it all. It's much more fluid than just someone creates standards documents and then browser manufacturers implement them. Mm. Okay, this episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. Go to do.co slash LNL and you can get $100 credit with 60 days to use it. Now, what DigitalOcean offers is an opportunity, an opportunity to do whatever you want with Linux or even FreeBSD in data centers all around the world that have got really fast network access and really fast SSDs. Whether that's just a little $5 a month droplet running Ubuntu or Fedora or Debian or CentOS, that you could use for running a website or a next cloud server, all the way up to hugely powerful servers all around the world with tons of block storage or object storage attached. The possibilities really are endless. If you can do it with Linux, you can do it with DigitalOcean. They've also got some container distros, CoreOS, Fedora Atomic, and Rancher OS. But if you don't like any of those, you can just use your own custom image. And you can either start with a bare bones distro installation and then just build it up exactly how you want it, Or if you want to take a shortcut, they've got loads of one-click apps like Basic Lamp and Lemp Stacks, WordPress, Discourse, GitLab. You can pick exactly what suits your needs as well because they've got CPU-optimized droplets if all you need is raw power. And I mentioned the block storage and object storage. You just decide how much you want and attach it to your droplet. One of the really useful features is the backups. You just enable it for the droplet that you want, and then that's it. You've got your peace of mind. I've been recommending DigitalOcean to people since long before they sponsored this show, and I've been using their services for years now, and I've always been really impressed with it. So go to do.co slash LNL and get that $100 credit. Try them out. You've got nothing to lose. Go to do.co slash LNL. So the Stack Overflow developer survey results are fairly interesting. More than half of the respondents say they use Linux. Yeah, I think that's especially how things seem maybe ten years ago when you you know everyone seemed to be using macOS. macOS barely, uh, well, it, it, it gets what it gets twenty two percent. But I was just comparing it to this time last year, and Linux was forty eight point three percent. But perhaps most interesting was that Windows desktop or server last year was thirty five percent, and this year it's fifty percent. So, you know, lots of people taking Windows much more seriously. Yeah, it, the, the survey basically breaks down as um, this is people using this on their desktop, as I understand it. 50% of the Windows and then 25% Mac, 25% Linux, roughly. What I don't know is whether more Stack Overflow people are starting to use Windows or whether more Windows people are starting to use Stack Overflow. Yeah, that's the impossible thing, isn't it? There's no way to really know that for sure. And that's why any any such surveys like this, you have to kind of take them with a bit of a pinch of salt. And you do, especially if you look at um, a lot of the demographic stuff in the survey, um, the people in there are overwhelmingly guys like us. So it's not- They're younger than us. They're younger than us. God, I feel old looking at uh, 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 Okay, yes. They're, 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 they're overwhelmingly people like us in 1995. <laughs> yes, I will, I will give you that point. Yeah, that is depressing. Um, but it's, it's interesting. I mean, it, it's not just Windows. Things like um, development environments, the most popular one with over half the people is Visual Studio Code. More people are using mm. VS Code than all the others put together which I think is remarkable. I mean, fine, not among mobile developers, but even among mobile developers. Um, And obviously, a lot of stuff gets double counted here, but Android Studio and Visual Studio Code are about the same, and Xcode's at about a third. 
And I, I, I think it's it's a remarkable re-rise back to fame from Microsoft. They're building technology that people want to use. Yeah, and embracing Linux and open source to some extent with it. Um, they, they, I think the ship is turning slowly, and people don't like it. But I think the reality is that I always say this: they realise that's where the money is, and it's actually working for them. Hang on, when you say people don't like it, as far as I can tell, people do like it. Everyone's using their stuff. That's what the survey says. People who people who still still spell Microsoft with a M dollar sign wind blows. <laughs> yeah, exactly. People who still spell Microsoft with a dollar sign in the middle. Yes, they don't like it, but I mostly don't care about those people's opinion. <laughs> An interesting thing that I noticed is that uh, looking at the survey from last year, Linux was very closely associated with Android. Um, you can see this in the correlated technologies section of the um, survey results. So, yeah, so last year, Linux, Android, Android Studio, Java, all very closely related. This year, Android has moved over to the Windows camp, and Linux is now very closely associated with all of the cloud side of things and the um, artificial intelligence and machine learning side of things. So there's been a change there of of developer focus uh, for Linux, going towards more perhaps low-level stuff instead of, uh, instead of app development. Yeah, I I I'd, I'd agree with that. Actually, I mean, um, the the Stack Overflow community is very weight, very heavily weighted towards web developers and so on and so forth. There's hardly any game developers. Like leaving aside demographic stuff, it's not even representative of the software industry. It's representative of a bit of the software industry. Um, so there aren't there aren't particularly game developers on there. There's hard there's not a lot of C developers. There's not a lot of R developers, so on and so forth. Um, but the AI stuff is becoming a bigger and bigger deal. Yeah, so it would seem. All right, well, let's end the news uh, with just a very quick mention and congratulations, really, to the UbiPorts guys. They've now finally sorted out their foundation, and have got their financial ducks in a row, and can actually move forward and concentrate on the software and not worry so much about all of the tax stuff and all the rest of that and potentially maybe at some point do some OEM deals or something like that. They needed to do this and it, it's taken a very long time. It seems that Germany is not the best place to start doing stuff like this because bureaucracy takes a very long time there. But um, I thought it was worth giving them a shout out anyway. Congratulations, guys. Good work, guys. Ready for a bunch of touch. Indeed. I remember the video that you made of that many years ago, <laughs> how to use it. Uh, it's still mostly relevant now. It is, actually. I was mildly pleased to see that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right, on to a bit of admin then. And first of all, thank you everyone for supporting us on PayPal and Patreon. It's very much appreciated. And if you want to join them, you can go to latenightlinux.com slash support. And unlike Stuart, who listens to the ordinary feed... If you pay $5 or more per month on Patreon, you can get access to an ad-free feed so you don't have to listen to the adverts. And if you want to get in contact with us, go to latenightlinux.com slash contact. And one other quick thing to mention is Fuss Talk Live 2019. That's happening on the 8th of June at Harrison near King's Cross. And uh, we will all be there, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Graham, if you are going to make it. Yeah. Yeah, and so there's going to be... The Ubuntu podcast, Late Night Linux, uh, Linux Lads, and the um, the mashup show with Dave, Marius, Stuart, and me. Um, we all need to really get our asses in gear and sort out exactly what's going to happen, and I need to sort out a final lineup. Um, the tickets are sold out at the moment, um, but that doesn't mean you can't come. Uh, because a lot of people who get a free ticket just don't bother coming. Uh, if you did reserve a free ticket and now you can't come, then it would be good if you could go back to Eventbrite and cancel that ticket so someone else can have it. Um, it should be good fun. I'm very much looking forward to it. Likewise. Okay, this episode is sponsored by CDN77. Go to cdn77.com. And they are a UK-based CDN provider with a standalone live streaming platform providing end-to-end -end video solutions. They sponsor loads of great projects like CentOS, KDE, Fedora, Gentoo, and Funtu. And one of their standout clients is the European Space Agency, who use CDN77 to deliver Hubble images all around the world. And this CDN is built from over 500 servers, all running Debian. 
and most of them are physical servers, only a few of them are VMs. And everything is developed in-house by CDN77. They make their own DDoS protection, and through the optimizations that they've done, they can push 80 gigabits per second of live streaming through just one machine. They've got 30 points of presence in North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia, with daily peaks regularly exceeding 4 terabits per second. They're really big on innovation as well. They were the first CDN to implement features like HTTP2 and broccoli compression. But most importantly, it's really easy to use. I hosted an episode of the JRS podcast on there, and it was really easy to put the file on there and link to it. And I've had no complaints about the speed from people downloading it all over the world. They've recently launched some new monthly plans with the best value on the market from $9.99 per terabytes as a global flat rate. And they've also got a pay-as-you-go option with no commitments and full transparency. They've got a 14-day trial with no credit card needed, so go to cdn77.com and sign up there. And once you've done your free trial and you're ready to go for the paid option, then mention Late Night Linux to the sales or tech support team, and you get an extra first payment bonus. So, for example, if you topped up $1,000, you'd get an extra 400 on top of that. So go to cdn77.com, sign up, and start delivering your content. So, Will, you had something of a shower thought recently. Yeah, and I've seen a few news stories along similar lines uh, in the last couple of days. So I guess something happened that triggered a lot of people to think like this. And it was probably that the Linux kernel has just turned 28 years old. Um, And Red Hat is also now 25 years old. So I got to thinking that... Early Linux adopters are now, you know, something like 40-ish years old. Um, and I would suggest that those early users who used to write mode lines and compile their own kernels and all that kind of thing now don't have the time or the energy to care about things uh, in the in the way that we used to. So what do they do? Do they move to Mac? Do they use Ubuntu where they don't have to do any work? Or do they actually keep their hand in and and continue to faff around with all this sort of low-level stuff? I mean, I know from my personal uh, experience that trying to compile my own kernel to get a new driver for a device is just something that I would never consider doing anymore. But what what do you guys think? And, and do you think that people coming to Linux these days have the expectation that things will just work because of the work done over the last, you know, whatever, 20 years to um, to make Linux just work? Or do you think that they still want to get down into the nuts and bolts of how it all works? Well, I'm a Johnny Cumb lately to this. I've only been using Linux for like 10-ish years. And when I came to it then... I think it must have been, it was um, 8.04, Ubuntu 8.04 that I first installed as my full-time daily driver. And even back then, there was none of this mode lines nonsense. Everything just worked perfectly, unless you had like weird hardware or something like that. And on standard Intel hardware and stuff, I had no problems. I've, I've never had to deal with any of this. And I was always very pragmatic and dual booted, always had that Windows partition for things where I needed a a driver that just wasn't in Linux. So I was never going to be compiling my own kernel. So I think that even people of my vintage have never had to deal with this shit. It's only you real greybeards. And I think people coming into it now wouldn't even dream of anything like that. Like most people who get into Linux now don't even expect to use the command line very much. Never mind to have to start pissing around with that sort of stuff. So I, I think that... What you remember is like just a completely bygone era. Well, so here's another thought then. In those early days, when you got a new webcam, there was a very good chance that it was going to be some brand new chipset that had never been seen by man before. Uh, and if you plugged it in, it wouldn't work, except you perhaps found a blog post from some guy who'd, who'd got a rudimentary driver. That seems to have changed now, right? You can be pretty sure that if you go to Amazon and order uh, a webcam or a microphone or, you know, something and plug it in, there's a very good chance that it's going to work. Now, is that because chipsets now are all basically the same? There's perhaps sort of two or three main hardware providers and everyone just uses the same chips. Or is it that there is less innovation nowadays and all of the the bits and bobs that you buy are just rehashed um, old products? 
I think there's as much innovation as there used to be. It's just not happening in webcams. <laughs> um, it's it, it's the it's the nature of any class of product to eventually become commoditized, you know. But if you look at think of innovation that has happened in webcams, right? Um, they say. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. That thing which um, took a picture from all focuses simultaneously so you could zoom into different bits of it, mm. right? doesn't work on Linux because they had to build new hardware to do it and Linux isn't supported. Yes, most of the commodity webcams that you go out and buy from Amazon or your local electronic shop or whatever – will probably be based on one of half a dozen different underlying chipsets and they've, they're all either supported or reverse engineered now and were 20 years ago. No problem. But take another example. If you want to use, say, a DSLR as a webcam, so you want really good quality, rather than just pointing a, a cheap webcam at yourself so you can Skype with your family, if you want to record YouTube videos or something like that and have a decent quality camera and you want to get that camera and plug it into Linux to do it, a lot of the time that's quite difficult because you need to be using the special Canon software or Nikon software or Fujifilm software where it doesn't exist for Linux and some of it's been reverse engineered and some of it just works and it presents itself as a V4L2 device and some of it is you can download this thing off GitHub and compile it. So... I think that where innovation is happening, you're still in that situation. We're just not buying hardware where innovation happens. This reminded me of the discussion we just had about um, the the um, Stack Overflow survey, where I think there's a certain kind of anthropomorphism in the way that we're asking. It's a really interesting question, but say there were tens of thousands of people 25 years ago who were attracted to Linux um, because it was geeky and interesting and you could really engage with your computer. I imagine there's even more than those tens of thousands of people who are using Linux for those exact same reasons, but its popularity has expanded such that it's, you know, the community is now, you know, 95% not those kind of people and people who want to use Linux as a, an operating system they can install for free. And that that's a real technical innovation. And I think they're, they're the kind of, Yes, they're the kind of people that I don't want to say I find difficult to understand, but that's the challenge now perhaps for the next generation is to understand the motivation of people using Linux in that kind of way to be able to keep innovating and pushing things forward where once it was just getting your webcam to work and incidentally my webcam still doesn't work and I still can't suspend <laughs> my machine. <laughs> Do you think that there's value in learning about the history of, of how these things were in the bad old days? Or is that just water under bridge and we should all just move on and focus on new stuff? I think so. I mean, this is a personal opinion of mine, but I strongly think that, um, like we were talking about Chef before, I think the success of Linux comes fundamentally from the rights of the open source license. And I have seen, you know, it's a bit of a boring kind of rhetoric to keep using and banging on about, especially to the new generation. Um, but I do think, think it's like the, found, the foundation of Linux is an open source's success. And even though it's, I don't want to be a zealot about it, I think teaching a little bit about the history and about the reasons why Linux is free and it's open source and you can download the code and do whatever you want with it is a is a way of kind of telling the next generation, look, this is why it's successful and you it's your guy's responsibility to make sure that those rights aren't eroded. Isn't it a case, though, that the kind of people who were into that when you lot first got into Linux these days would be more into hardware hacking and going to maker spaces and Raspberry Pi jams and stuff. Yeah, maybe, but that's that's to me that's the same thing. You know, Linux is the same thing. I mean, a, a lot of the time they're going to be using Linux or Arduino or Raspberry Pi, and yeah, and the, the, to them it's important that the the circuit designs are open source and the tools that they use to program their firmware are open source, and that's still a challenge. And and so kind of Linux is the kind of the main platform for that kind of tinkering, and they will use Linux as really important yeah but they will never use linux on the desktop they'll be using linux on the raspberry pi or their robots or whatever but then they wouldn't dream of using it on the desktop they just use windows i don't know how important the desktop's going to be in the in the far future um you know they're using linux desktop on android or on chrome os um you know and of course we want them to use the linux desktop but are more and more people using a desktop computer no i don't think they are 
Well, no, definitely not. Gartner will tell you that it's uh, shrinking every quarter and has done for about 10 years. Not really. Um, it shrank for a while um, when everyone was writing newspaper articles saying, desktop computers are dead, everyone's just going to use tablets now. But it's actually pretty much leveled off now. Really? Yeah. The much-helded um, death knell of the desktop computer has not happened. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that was exactly how I felt about it as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's plateaued, and plateauing is basically shrinking if you're not growing, you're dying and all that. No. <laughs> that's, utter, that's not what plateaus mean at all. <laughs> Actually, the Linux desktop is like the most innovative desktop it is where you want to do things it's always has been you get know, it off no it, it isn't <laughs> it had, no but i mean things like gnome do leading to quicksilver and the whole paradigm that kind of apple took for pervasive search the semantic desktop these are ideas that were never fully realized in linux but there were a lot of ideas that kind of started off as development projects on linux and so it's still a cool place to be if that's what your thing is I would certainly agree that for any major software product that comes out in a different operating system, Windows, Mac, Android, and iOS to a large extent, someone will be able to point at some 25% finished five-year <laughs> yeah, abandoned yeah. SourceForge project and say, we did it first. However, if the, the difference between me at... 20 and me, well, one of the myriad of differences between me at 20 and me at 40 is that the me at 40 understands that having an idea and writing the first 10%, which is the easy bit, mm. is the easy bit. <laughs> the thing, the, the thing which makes something actually useful to yourself, to the world is getting it finished. And we're not good at that, which is why I disagree with when you say, um, the Linux desktop is the most innovative. It one. is. Look at macOS. What has Apple done to its desktop recently? They don't care about macOS. They, all their innovations on iOS. And more importantly, they can do things like say, okay, we will build a document framework where every application automatically saves all of your documents and you can roll back different versions and go back to the version you were doing yesterday and it all saves automatically. And they can just put that in the desktop and it works because it's built on existing other desktop technologies. We can't do that because if you built that, three quarters of the application developers in the world on Linux would refuse to implement it on principle and would say, well, this is a GNOME technology that we refuse to use. This is a KDE technology. And even if we had it, if the KDE desktop did that, if they were in a position to build something like that, something actually useful, not something like being able to configure your Wi-Fi in a different way, an actual useful thing like that, and they built it, it would still only be available in KDE applications on a KDE desktop, right? That's actual innovation. That's useful because it means that my parents can go, oh no, I made a change to that document. Oh, it's okay. I'll just roll back to the version yesterday. That's way more useful than going, oh look, we can make the desktop appear like it's got flames around the outside. <laughs> that's an interesting example that you use because that's a good example why I hate macOS. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I agree with you, and I use it quite a lot. And But if the fact you can't even save stuff as a file name a lot of the time or understand the file system that you're saving to. Yeah, that, to some extent, I think plays back into Bill's original question that we've been doing this a long time. So when I, if I use a system where um, you can't get at the files underneath. Like Android always kind of was and kind of wasn't, and iOS very much was until very recently. Um, I think to myself, my in my brain, I know that there's a file system underneath all of this. It's not actually being held in some glittering mesh of magic silicon like a William Gibson book. I know under the covers you have just saved a file on the file system. Let me see the file on the file system. That's what I want, please. I don't want your stupid restricted interfaces. It's the same reason why on an Android phone. I don't like things like um, the Google News app. I'd rather read Google News on the web because when I want to copy an image out of it, the app won't let me do it. You're as bad as my wife. She um, refuses to install any apps. She's like, no, I'll just use the website. And so Twitter, Facebook. Yep, me too. She just uses all of them. She just has them in you know, bookmarks or whatever. And I'm like, no, Twitter's much better with the app. Honestly, you can do this, that, and the other. And she's like, no, why would I use an app when I can just use a website? Fair play to her. Um, but that, that, to me, that sort of thing, 
Um, coming up with one individual isolated idea which does something that no one else has done, yes, is innovative, I grant you, and that is good. But what I would like to see more is being able to do the second level ideas, things where you can say, let's do a newly innovative thing, which relies on the fact that this previous stuff already exists. But if you want to build something for Linux, which is that second level of innovation, you basically have to go, right, it's going to work on one distribution. Because other than that, you can't rely on the rest of the stuff existing. I don't know, Will, are you going to uh, make the case for snaps here? Or are you not that much of a company man? <laughs> This is this is not this is not a snaps thing. This is something that um, the snap framework itself might provide, and I'd love to see that. But I, it's something that should be in Ubuntu core, I think. Um, every application being able to just save documents in a standard way, and that standard interface is provided by mm. SnapD. That'd be great. But this is not snaps themselves don't solve this. It's that we don't. It's the platform that we build on is deliberately very minimalistic it's the debian net install or ubuntu core or whatever and the desktop platform i'd like to see the commonality have a much higher watermark than it currently does that to me is innovation because then i can build um i can innovate in the way we do search on the desktop without having to build a desktop search engine first (laughs) Yeah, I think what you're saying is a real problem. And it reminds me of the problem we have with federated social media. It's it's the fact that things, so many things have become services. And we've got the right ideas, but it's very difficult to take that and make it effectively work in a way that's um, federated. Um, I don't I don't have a solution to that. But it would be wonderful if somebody could come up with a way of federating services that we could host in some way anybody could host them canonical or red hat or whoever well this is a fascinating discussion that we could probably carry on for about five hours but um i think time is uh, the enemy as always has got the better of us so thank you very much for joining us Stuart. it's been great to have you and um the guys were worried that uh, we wouldn't have enough news stories i said don't worry Stuart <laughs> likes to talk a lot it'll be fine and sure enough it was so yes thank you for that um so the next episode, I should have done this in the uh, uh, admin section, but the next episode is going to be a special because I'm going to be away in that Murica, that Trumpistan, um, if they'll let me in, that is. Um, your advice, Stuart, was make as many jokes as possible with the TSA. They love that. So, yes, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, and so there's going to be a special episode, Ooh, but uh, hopefully Phalium will be back and we'll be... Um, having a normal episode in four weeks time from this um but until then i have been joe i've been graham i've been will and i've been Stuart. see you later